Well, thank you for joining us uh, this week with Severe. Uh, on this episode, uh, we will meet uh, Patrick Givens. Uh, so kind of give you a background with Patrick. Patrick brings a user-led tech-enabled approach to building transformative products, brands, and businesses for clients ranging from Fortune 500 to new world, new to world startups. Uh, for the past four years, he has led Vayner Smart, Vayner Media's innovation and emerging technologies division, which he founded in 2016. He spearheaded the extension of Vayner Media's pioneering uh, social media and digital marketing into emerging markets, uh, such as uh, voice first conversational uh, AI, uh, connected uh, retail and interactive uh, packaging. He's also had the opportunity to speak to audiences around the world about topics like conversational marketing, sonic uh, branding, and ethical innovations. And most importantly, uh, Patrick and I actually uh, started with Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V's uh, Vayner Media. Uh, I think like maybe a week apart. I was the head of Vayner Commerce at that time, and and Patrick uh, started up the group uh, uh, Vayner Smart, and both of them were basically startup groups uh, inside of uh, Vayner Media, and that's how uh, Gary runs these kind of organizations. And uh, uh, I really respect Patrick for the skill set that he brings in uh, around all of these smart devices and new medium of uh, interaction uh, by consumers to brands and from brands to consumers uh, both ways. Uh, the obvious one is uh, Alexa. Uh, during this show, I'm sure that my Alexa is going to keep on going off and telling me I'm sure I, I don't I'm sure I don't understand what you're saying or something like that. I do have a Google Home in the back of me too. So those things are going to just go haywire during the show. So just ignore it, please. <laughs> uh, I, I should have muted those speakers, uh, but but I didn't. But it'd be very funny. Uh, but but I really respect Patrick uh, of, of what he has been able to accomplish at Vayner, as well as uh, that he continues doing. Uh, right now, he's he's doing some consulting uh, around uh, these kind of devices, advising uh, quite a lot of uh, clients and stuff like that. You should uh, uh, definitely. I'll put up uh, how you can uh, reach out to Patrick. And uh, well, Patrick. Yeah. Welcome, welcome to this week with Sabir. Thank you so much, Sabir. It's awesome to talk with you and hate hey everybody out there. All right. Uh, so I, I wanted to, um, to kind of get started with like, because the audience members are, are, are like, they come from different types of uh, backgrounds. They may know about voice or they may have a device, but they may not know it from a professional standpoint, how to kind of utilize it in marketing, how to utilize it and. uh, uh, you know, in, in their context of, of if they're running a brand or if they're running a business, we do have quite a lot of audience members that come from like small business background and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, so, um, uh, so before we get started with those kind of questions, I want to know like how did you get first get uh, involved in uh, in voice? Yeah. So as you mentioned, um, we started up around the same time with Gary uh, doing the kind of adjacent groups there. At VaynerMedia, I think you were maybe the second person in the whole company I spoke to when I got seated down my first day, sitting next to you there. <laughs> uh, and actually, when I started that practice, it was meant to be it's an IoT group, is what we were talking about, Internet of Things. So what was the new set of connected devices that were around people all day? Um, Gary and I started, we met back in early 2015, and we're talking about this at that time. How was it going to change the way that products were discovered, used, repurchased, um, everything when you had points of connectivity everywhere it was kind of migrating we'd gone from desktop to the mobile phone and now from mobile phone out to this kind of omnipresent connections around you all over the place so that was the vision when i got there it's how do we use that and figure out the product and marketing opportunities that, that unlocks and it was not actually with voice front and center because of the timing there that was january 2016 uh amazon alexa had just opened third-party development as we got started mm -hmm. it was even come online uh, for third-party developers for almost a year after that and so the way i got started was actually with a very organic client brief um this is one that's a public case anyone can go try it out but uh diageo johnny walker uh, guided oh, whiskey tastings yeah i um, remember that yeah you probably remember seeing me test out the guided whiskey tastings at my desk a couple of times that was one of my favorite research projects mm -hmm. uh this was one where our clients over at Diageo were interested in scaling out a guided tasting. It was a mentorship program they had done. So for any of the industries out there, think of this as it's a brand ambassador. It's kind of a customer service orientation. It's not that top of funnel reach driving. It's not new acquisition, but it's actually something where 
after initial awareness, you might be driving affinity. Um, in the case of Diageo there, it was really about coaching from past that initial trial to get people to be big brand fans, um, increase their return rate to the brands and actually turn into evangelists moving out. They get, became real fans of the brand who could tell their friends. So we were trying a number of different channels to try and scale this mentorship program. We definitely did the video series as always at Vayner, uh, a good social video series part of any plan. And that was one of our, that was our big volume driver. That was how we were hitting our uh, reach numbers. But what we realized was when you went from a live in-person tasting with maybe five, 10 people around a table with a master of whiskey, the value in that wasn't your scale so much as the impact. It was the depth of engagement and how much time you got to go back and forth and really learn and feel the brand. Really, uh, you know, not just taste the whiskey, but get a sense for the whole atmosphere. Um, and so we needed something interactive. We needed something beyond just a video. And so then we started to explore what were some new interactive technologies that might help scale this. We did a messenger experience on Facebook that had some areas of success to it, but ultimately we found going back and forth just with text and image was a little dry and we were losing a lot of that ambiance. And at that point, as I said, Amazon Alexa was just coming out of the gate. Mm -hmm. We had never done any work on it. And I think I still remember Sabir asking you for some of your contacts on the retail side at Amazon so I could go and chase around the halls there and figure out somebody who worked on this new thing called Alexa and start talking to them. Um, ultimately, we built what was one of, I believe it was one of the first 700 skills on Alexa, something like that. Very, very early days there. Um, but got this program set up and it was really amazing how quickly we saw uptick both in quantity of usage and granted, this was early days. There was a lot less competition for people's attention on the platform then. Um, and we were fortunate to get some really nice press out of the gate. But also where we saw retention in the sessions, we were seeing out of the gate these sessions that were lasting for five, 10 minutes of people exploring a, each of the different labels of whiskey, getting the comparison notes and the tastings, all these things. Um, and so it was somewhere where we continued to go back, reinvest, do more and more user research and figure out what about this experience people love, where were the points of friction that they didn't love so much. And this became, it was one of those light bulb moments where you saw a couple of focus groups using this experience. We're like, wow, this is exactly the answer to a brief of how do I scale an interactive experience? Okay, this is a platform that can really do it. Um, so that was 2016. That got me rolling in the space. It got our practice at Vayner going. And we really grew from there. We um, built out what I'm really proud to say was one of the world's leading design firms for voice. We were an Alexa Developers Advisory Council lead all the way through uh, the duration of the department up until April of this year. One of the leading designers and builders on Google Assistant. And then as we can go into through this conversation, partners with lots of other ecosystem players, smaller platforms, emerging technologies, both hardware and software side that as these things start to plug together, make this big nebulous term voice something that you can actually use and can actually drive a business. I, I think one of the first in the industry or maybe even in the world, I, I remember a um, uh, voice agency on record was the, yeah. that, was, that was a huge accomplishment on your side. Yeah, we were really, really proud of that. So that was with JP Morgan Chase. Um, and it was, you're absolutely right. It was the very first of its kind relationship that one was negotiated through 2017 and came into play January 2018. Um, but really what that meant was rather than as an agency being engaged on a project by project basis to build what amounted to one-off apps really, right? Like Alexa skills or Google Actions, these are voice applications. So rather than being engaged to build one, then build another, then build another, the team over at Chase and JP Morgan understood that voice was gonna be the future of how their customers interacted with that business across the lines of business. So this is everything from way high net worth individuals on the financial advisory side under JP Morgan, over to your home lending clients in Chase, your retail branch um, cards, everything. They have lots of different customers doing lots of different types of business with them. And they needed dynamic solutions in voice that were gonna be able to ebb and flow with the S coming in. And more than that, they needed a roadmap for where this was all going. Uh, it was obvious when we were starting to work together in late 2016 and early 2017, that there were lots of little tactical options and many of which we actually did roll out uh, quick Alexa skills or Google actions to start building some learnings. And that was great. But that voice AOR relationship was really powerful because it meant working with a really holistic perspective, doing interviews across all those lines of business to start stacking what were their needs, 
where could we get some efficiencies as a business, build things once it could be deployed across different lines of business? And maybe more to the point, how could we build an organization-wide learning agenda? Because voice is like any other innovation space, right? If you're investing there, you're doing so some percentage for immediate returns. You need to validate your investment and have a real business case for why you're spending today, but also a huge part of the reason to bother with it is because you see it rising in importance on maybe a two to three year trajectory from now, and you don't want to just be starting that. I mean, so there are, um, let, let's unpack it for our audience. There are uh, quite a few technical word or phrases that you use there. You know, yeah. uh, voice assistant, voice search, um, uh, voice interaction, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe you said uh, Alexa skill. But uh, if, if you look at it, is it just Alexa? Is it just Google Home? What, what does it mean? Is it just a speaker? Uh, so let, let's go through that a little bit more. Yeah, let's do that. So it's interesting. While I think we've gotten pretty good definition on the video and visual side of the digital ecosystem right now, audio and voice are actually almost intentionally nebulous. It's so confusing what we mean with a lot of these different uh, conversations that come into play. So. I want to break apart both the elements and the big platform elements in this ecosystem and what you use them for as a marketer, right? Mm -hmm. So let's expand out from voice for a minute and talk digital audio because these are all starting to integrate anyway. When you're in digital audio, we all think about podcasts, right? We all think about streaming music, so that's your, your Spotify, your Amazon Music, your Pandora's. Those are going to be elements where you could drive reach and acquisition, right? you reach new people. But also, it's where a user, somebody working with the end, has already is in a digital audio experience. And so now what we're starting to see that gets this system much more exciting is the ability to hand off from that where you're projecting out audio, whether it's an ad or a podcast, or whatever it is, what you've recorded and projected out to enable some interaction. That's when you get to these voice AI systems, the assistants. And so the two biggest that we want to think about, particularly for North America, but really globally outside of uh, APAC, are going to be Amazon Alexa and Google Assistant. You're also in this space potentially Microsoft Cortana, Samsung's Bixby. Uh, we can talk about Apple Siri. It doesn't have the same open developer ecosystem, and so it doesn't really serve the same purposes. In the I result. think not yet. Yeah, yeah. But knowing and, Apple, I, there will be like a voice app store. <laughs> well, you would think so, right? But they had quite a lead over everyone else, right? They were out in market almost 10 years before Alexa oh, yeah. with the voice assistant and made a strategic decision, as they have with a couple of other spaces recently, to stay closed because they wanted, to, maybe that's for privacy, maybe it's handling the voice data. Um, they've used it as an interface for their mobile phones and full stop. And so then you get Siri shortcuts where you can command a mobile app by voice, mm -hmm. different than a voice application, but we'll talk in a second about how the other platforms are kind of migrating in that direction now too. Um, but I think important before we move on from that is that there's also, so we named some of the giant tech players that have their voice programs and a few got to keep your eye on Facebook where they're going with all of this, Pandora and Spotify rolling in voice assistants as well. Everyone's starting something in this space. And then there's a whole ecosystem of what I would call domain specific voice assistants. So think about companies like Serence and Nuance who are specializing in both healthcare and auto. Um, you've got specializations around restaurants and retail application. You've got specialization. I think auto is one of the really exciting spaces here. We can talk a little more there. Um, so for any businesses looking to get into this, I think what you want to start with is what are the roles in, let's call it your, whether you call it a funnel or a customer journey, what are the jobs to be done along that journey where you're looking? So up in that initial acquisition and reach space, you're probably not in an interactive voice. You're probably not building, I mentioned Alexa skills and Google Actions. Those are just those platforms name for an interactive voice app. But Imagine it just like you would a mobile app. You're not building a mobile app to drive reach. That's something that happens after people are aware of you and once they are trying to engage further and whether that's complete a purchase or engage with some kind of publishing or entertainment content, great. That's where we are in the interactive voice side of the application. So we first got to drive reach and discovery. That's going to happen out on some of those streaming channels. Uh, driving into hopefully then a use case where it's important to prioritize something that's both going to be of high value to the business because again we're not going to be talking about this reaching at this point in time you'd be very luck lucky to hit in the hundreds of thousands of monthly sessions most skills and actions really more down in that tens of thousands and so again you want to reprioritize from a mass reach and acquisition and awareness driving space where you're trying to hit 
a wide number and matriculate them down, down to one where I even look at these as post-purchase. How are you play? Uh, how are you helping to coach a really good usage session and migrate people into a subscribe and save? Or how do you mm -hmm. do uh, interactive instructions that then leave people with a great first session and off telling others and helping to kind of do peer referral for your brand? Something Actually, little... Alexa has been starting to ask me for my purchases uh, to give a yeah. review. Would you yep. give it, how many stars would you like to give it? I go like, okay, I'll, I'll go with four or five. Yeah. So I think that, that kind of a feedback loop uh, is going to be a lot easier than for me to be uh, on, either on my phone or even uh, on a keyboard on a, on a, on a, on a desktop or, or a laptop. It's, it's a lot easier for me. It's just a quick interruption. I go like, oh, yeah, I, I really like that product. I like that hot sauce. It's like uh, five stars, you know? It would be a great example to break down a little bit for what's good over voice versus what's not. Yeah. If what Amazon was asking you there for was really complex and they wanted you to write the long form review and give your whole explanation of what was good and bad, not so great on voice. Also, if they want, if you were trying to shop in the initial purchase and it was comparison shopping, you wanted to look at five different items, again, not great by voice. But what they're asking you there is one data point, a quick exchange, just mm -hmm. say the number of stars you want, come back. And it's a step along a process. I think it's Something we often run into whenever a new interface is coming up, and this is true of mobile, right? Where initially we probably went from print into desktop first and foremost, and then yeah. started porting experiences from desktop to mobile. Well, mobile is different from a computer. You have a smaller screen size, so you have some different limitations, but you also have location awareness. So you have some new um, ability and ability to be contextually relevant. We're just at the tipping point now of starting to use that in voice in the same way. Where it's it's funny you say yeah. that because uh, in in history, uh, when when internet was starting to get commercialized, I, I've been I'm, I'm I'm an OG, so I've been there for, since the very beginning. Uh, the initial sites uh, websites were called uh, brochures, basically. Can I put yeah. my brochure up uh, on, really? on 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 the internet? Yeah, and that was the term being used. Brochure was the term being used. E-commerce came much later than that, you know. But the initial sites, everything looked like a brochure, basically. Some of them actually literally took the brochure photo uh, or scan, and then they just uploaded it. They didn't even bother to like type it in uh, into HTML, you know. I mean, those first couple of years of voice, that's exactly what we were getting. To. <laughs> we were. I mean, it's why you can find about a thousand different recipe skills and actions on there because every packaged good brand had a recipe section in their website with a whole bunch of searchable content that sounded really easy to reformat for voice. And it's also why when you use a lot of those recipe experiences, it's pretty impossible to get through a recipe. They're rigid. It's They're designed as though you're scrolling around a page with written text that you can come back to whatever you want. You have as much time to use. In voice, there's a whole different set of design considerations. And so it's not to say you can't do, you can do really great recipe experiences on voice. I'm actually, uh, both the platforms have pretty nice first party experiences now. And I'm an advisor to a company who is really trying to use that multimodal. The, so we say multimodal as both voice and video and visuals together uh, to create really immersive, awesome recipe experiences. But it's not just pick up the recipe section, the text from your website, and have Alexa read it out in her voice. It's not going to do the trick. Yeah. So there is a question. Uh, actually, this guy seems to be a fan. You know, he regularly comes up. Here we go. I'm going to put it up. Can you, do you see it? Yeah. Uh, yep. What I want to do, though, uh, in order to kind of make it a bit more broader, uh, as marketers, what should we be looking at voice to do? Like, what, what are some marketing objectives where voice is actually very effective? Like, in my case, when my clients ask me from social, digital, I'm talking about keyboard input or, or finger input on a, on a mobile or social or e-commerce, I, I know where, what my go-to platforms are. I know exactly what the CPA is. I know exactly... How, how people uh, interact and st stuff like that. So I, I know all of those things. What does that world look like from a voice standpoint? And as, as you're answering that, you could answer this question from Mark Peterson also. Uh, he's a small business owner, makes small batches of uh, hot sauces. He, he was actually kind enough to send me from the last show. He had sent me uh, yeah. some samples that I had tried out. Um, uh, it's delicious. Uh, I think it's available locally in his market. Uh, and I think he sells through online too. So he... How yeah. can we as marketers utilize and leverage this platform, voice platform? Right. So I think in, implicit in his question here jumps right to voice search, right? Do I need to target keywords for voice? So I think that's a worthwhile place to just start the conversation because that's often, again, porting over from our kind of previous models. What are we thinking about? And it makes a lot of sense. Voice is used in search quite a bit. 
there is not a paid ad product for voice search specifically on either Google or Amazon. So you could try to do organic content optimization with the, so I'll give this two answers. One, at a high level, I have still yet to see a specific voice search strategy net any tangible results. I see just about every search agency in the world pitch this as a service today. And when you dig into what is actually being done, it's often a series of best practices that I think aren't in and of themselves wrong, but also I've never seen progress a result from not being spot zero all the way into position zero, which when you think about the way voice works, you're not rising on a list on a screen and moving up into the first page of the world is good enough. You've got to be the default answer. Maybe you could get some value in a second slot if people ask for another response, but basically you need to be position zero or nothing in voice. Um, in terms of organic category search, it's just not a space where there's a good product to, uh, to buy into today. Um, so I should, I'm saying organic, but actually organic work, there isn't a paid option. So, but I, I think just just uh, being part of that industry, right? Yeah. Being part of the kind of the digital social industry, uh, I can tell you time and time again, like uh, whether it was Google when it started out uh, from Stanford, I was actually a beta tester at that time. Uh, by the time the paid uh, aspect of it came in, even though Yahoo at that time and Alta Vista were doing paid options at that time, mm -hmm. Google didn't want to do it that way. They wanted to figure out a different way of doing it, and that became yeah. actually an industry by itself. Uh, I can tell you that Facebook had had major failures <laughs> with, with the paid mm -hmm. option. Initially, they thought that they would be the Google of social media. They weren't. It, it was a completely a different medium, yep. right? I, I think I, I think here by, get, by Amazon taking the steps that it's taking to understand the behavior, I, I think uh, optimizing and doubling down on, on organic content, I think it makes a lot of sense, right? Once you have enough of that base, then coming up with uh, an interesting way of doing paid options. Maybe in case of uh, Amazon Echo, it might be Amazon listed products, for example, might get the first dibs versus right. uh, the wider internet. Uh, on the other hand, you have Google Home that might actually come up with interesting voice search options that has paid aspect to it that, that it could serve up first. A hundred percent will get there, just not there today. And yeah. so so specific to this question, or even as our, our audience is thinking about where voice fits in today versus the rest of the e-com content optimization, which is where, honestly, if the question is, how are you acquiring new users into your brand and new purchasers? Mm -hmm. It's not going to be voice, unfortunately, today. For Unfortunately for me, I think fortunately for um, a lot of our audience, this isn't where you need to spend your time on new user acquisition. That, that's first and foremost. It's not going to be the fastest return. Where this is of value, though, is scaling out some of that interactivity, something you might do either, it could be about portfolio search. So and I'll use the hot sauce example, but if you wanted to do something akin to where we went with food, whiskey tastings, where comparisons over flavor, a gifting flow, right? A couple of questions about, um, I wanna buy some beer, a hot sauce pack for his birthday, and I'm gonna answer a couple personality questions about him, it's gonna match me to the right one. My right. birthday already passed, by the way, just FYI. It's gonna be. <laughs> So things like that, though, really impactful. Or, and you mentioned in this case, it's a, a smaller local business. What we are starting to see is integration of, I'll call it conversational assistance, because I think it's important here also to think about voice and messaging in a continuum, especially when you're on Google Assistant. Those experiences can be done with a Google Home speaker over voice or on any Pixel phone. You've got Google Assistant native in there, and you can flow right back and forth between the two of them. Um, so suddenly now shopping assistants that are meant to help you with decisioning at shelf make a lot more sense. This is something I've been working with clients across a number of categories on right now is today we're thinking a lot about how do I effectively put a brand ambassador there at the shelf to help sort through the portfolio and match you to the right product to purchase. Um, and so again, this isn't net new awareness. I'm not spreading this out across the world. This is for someone standing at the shelf with a range of options in front of them. And in a retail context, it's about putting literally a shelf cling right there that says, ask Google Assistant, which one's for me? Something like that. Um, what I think is getting really exciting now though, and actually um, among the trends that we're seeing accelerated by our current moment of COVID and everything needing to be contactless and touchless is what that pre-shopping, 
pre-ordering looks like and how that can be handled over voice. And so now you get the intersection of two things, right? You get your kind of click and collect pre-shop model intersecting with hands-free, which is so powerful in auto. And as those clash together, as you have voice assistance built into just about every new um, model coming out on the auto space right now, what does it look like to have an optimized voice shopping experience so that as a customer, I'm ordering ahead, show up, and it's ready to go for pickup, like I might have done with click and collect in the past, but now I don't have to while driving, fumble around with my phone and figure out how to type all that in. Mm -hmm. That's a space that we see a lot of traction in right now. And even just over the last three or four months is getting pretty exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's funny you say that. What, what The thought that was going through my mind, uh, it's supposed to be hands-free driving, right? And right. then you, you have, you have a... Uh, you have a tool like Waze that everybody, it's a very popular uh, driving tool. People put it on their iPhone and, and, or their Android and, and they just uh, 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 go through. However, uh, what's interesting is the ads start popping up on Waze. Yes. I, I always find it curious, like, do, you, do, does, uh, do these apps, I'm not, I'm not blaming Waze here, but do these apps want me to get into an accident by distracting me with an ad while I'm driving? Right? right, even though I'm supposed to be hands-free, but imagine if that was much more. Because the thing is, the rest of it is voice already. Yep. Like while while it's not in an intrusive way, but maybe in a, a bit of a passive way. Uh, why why not ask me? Like, hey, mm -hmm. uh, after it says to make that left turn, uh, the very next thing, can it can it tell me? Well, like, hey, hey I just found this special deal. Are you feeling hungry? Um, well, like, yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. McDonald's, Applebee's, whatever, you know, is, is around the corner. And by the way, Dunkin' Donuts is giving away free coffee or something like that. You know, Yeah. voice based, interact with me like that. Don't show me an ad to distract me while I'm driving. <laughs> yeah. I think this is where, to me, it gets really exciting. Um, let's use Google as an example here. So if you, any of the made by Google events, the hardware announcements over the last couple of years, they talk a lot about ambient computing and there's basically this whole space is full of funky technical terms for really obvious concepts. In this, it's if you're talking about ambient computing, great, I've got a mobile phone, I've got a desktop, and now I have voice as an interface as well, possibly also some wearables, a watch, something like that. I've got a whole bunch of interfaces on me all the time that are connecting to a, the same set of both centralized data and centralized applications, things I can use to complete tasks there, right? And as a user, once I have all these different interfaces, I should be able to pretty fluidly jump from one to the other based on whatever is right for me in that given moment, and maybe even in the midst of one exchange, switch from one to the next. So in this instance, right, you're driving, you want to be talking, you want to be doing it by voice, so you can keep your hands on the wheel, eyes on the road, that makes a lot of sense. But then maybe you park the car and step out into the parking lot and it's noisy outside and I don't want to talk anymore. Now I want to type on my phone. Great. Mm -hmm. That session needs to carry from one to the next. This is the sort of design. Oh, there should be continuity uh, exactly. in, that, in, that, in that conversation. Absolutely. Okay. The example I always use is say you and I are talking and we're planning to go out to dinner tonight and we're sitting here on a video chat and you say to me, oh man, I had Italian the last three nights in a row. There's no way I'm getting Italian night. Anything else you want? And we talk and we're talking and we say, okay, I drive over, I get out and in person I say to you, all right, let's go get some, let's go get pizza. What the hell? I just told you I don't want to tie it tonight. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. That was in video chat. Now we're in person. I don't remember what happened before. That'd be so infuriating. It, it, it's unacceptable. And yet as brands and marketers, that's kind of the way we've entered into voice. We've built these little standalone applications that don't carry over the context from other places. It's where, you know, I'll jump back to it, that voice AOR relationship with Chase was specifically, this was the kind of a situation that that is meant to address and the sort of planning that I'll say that business is doing will get them ahead of. It's about having an assistant that actually works as an assistant and carries context over from one space to the next. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, so you have worked with in, uh, good voice in so many different contexts. I, I remember that you were working on a lot of interesting projects and stuff like that. Um, and, and you have covered quite a lot of the use cases where it was successes, it was grand slam, it was a home run, right? Yeah. But you and I both know, like, even I, over my career, I've had my my I'll call them mistakes. I'll call them yep. learnings. I can call them uh, doing things better next time. So, sure. what are some of those things? Like, you know what? As a brand, because people try to uh, put 
put like what is it a, a square in a circle peg or whatever you know yep. or I'm, I'm very bad with analogies by the way you got uh, it. <laughs> so you understand my point like yeah. what are some of those learnings or mistakes like where people tried to make it something that it was not supposed to be or 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 did you just got the learnings from it because it's an, it's an emerging new field yeah i think there's let's talk about two big buckets of those i'll give you a couple examples one of them is you got to be aware up front of the strengths and liabilities in the platform you're using so i'll say uh again this public example it's actually experience like a system that i really loved but then once you get into the actual activation of it we hit a lot of the platform limitations with GE back in the day. This was a program that GE wanted to build called Labracadabra. It's kind of STEM education support for kids. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think timeline wise. I think this was probably 2017, maybe 2018. Um, and a really cool program that we designed where it was actually physical kits for science experiments that kids could order. We, did, we launched this just before the holidays. Kids were going to be home on their winter breaks. And so it's kind of your at home science experiment, built the physical kits, those could be ordered. We had demo videos running in social to make people aware of these experiences and get them buying them. And then what we built was an Alexa skill that kind of served as your at home science teacher who was going to walk you through the experiments. And we designed it well. I think it worked nicely at that time. But a few of the uh, constraints on the platform that came in here. Initially, the goal at the time was to have people try one, one experiment out, and if you like it, okay, let's order the next one. We had, I think, eight of them or so at launch. Well, as we got through, there was some promise that we'd be able to integrate with Amazon Pay and that we'd start to be able to do purchase within a skill. That didn't come to fruition from the platform in time, so suddenly we're out there in market with this really nice science instructor coach We can't sell you anything. And so at the end of the experience, now we have to tell people, did you like that? Okay, go back to that website you were on before and go buy a new one. Really wonky experience. Actually, just from a timing standpoint, I think that was the time you could not even send uh, a link to the Alexa app. Still can't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you're not even able to put it on their phone. You're basically literally telling them go back to the website by voice. And then if anyone knows this, you do, because I remember hearing it from you about every other day, the speech recognition on the platform. You know, it, that's gotten a lot better in the years since. But the number My of name. Basically, exactly. a number of times that I would test the skill and it worked great. And it's like, gets my name and understands my accent. And then you slide your chair over and test the exact same thing. And you're like, it broke on step number two. <laughs> what happened? Why doesn't this work? Well, part of that is speech recognition. It's something where, gosh, we're in a time right now um, with so many of these cultural topics coming up. Uh, bias data sets is like a huge concern across AI. Uh, I wouldn't say most of all in voice, probably most of all in some other spaces, but in voice, that's the result of data training. Is it going to recognize different accents, different pronunciations? Um, there's some work to be done on the design side. I think we were better than most at trying to get ahead of alternative pronunciations and really build a lot of that into the hard coding. Um, but you can't necessarily just rely on the platform uh, speech recognition engines to get everything. So those are some of the limitations that we'd see um, from a platform side, what it could do. And then the other side of it there is kind of back to what I was saying before, the role you're expecting voice to play. If you come mm -hmm. in and look at a voice extension right inside your marketing mix, and oftentimes the clients that I'm working with may sit in a media function within a company. They, that may be the way that their budgets are deployed. Mm -hmm. It's on me to just make everyone aware up front that what we're talking about here, it's a digital product. It's not really media. It's you're building an interactive experience. So do use case identification. We do a lot of user desirability testing, meaning not just what can we build, but who cares? Who wants to use that thing that we are going to build and who's going to find it better than what else is out there today? So not just the novelty of trying it out once over voice, but actually come back and use it again and again, or have such a good experience in that one usage that whatever investment we put in to build the thing really actually is worthwhile. It's you know, in some cases, again, the most simple thing in the world, but it's doing a real business case before you go in and just start trying things out. I think uh, in an entrepreneurial world and working with, uh, I mentioned some of the big Fortune 1 and 500 clients I've worked with, tons and tons of work in the startup space as well. And a lot of the time we can lose some of that rigor of really business casing everything out because everything's moving quickly. Well, here it's about being honest with ourselves up front with what our expectations are of a given investment. 
And I would not put money in this space right now if you need immediate return on, again, new user acquisition or volume. But if you need a differentiator from a competitive class, this can actually be a pretty cheap way to get something really new and differentiated out there. If you need something that's going to scale that interactivity and really build some affinity, again, a little bit of design love here can go a long way in being better than anything else that's out there. Um, I mean, from from a um, oh, one, one of the challenges I've always had with voice, uh, and it's not, I don't think it's a, I mean, you, you said it earlier, 2016, right? So we're, we're looking at a technology that's maybe four, a little bit over four years old. You know, it, it's, I think it's in its infancy right now. Absolutely. It's like complaining about the early days of search or the early days of social media, you know? Yeah. Uh, the thing is, is, we're not there yet. You know, it's, it's, going, to, it's going to be uh, getting there. Uh, the way I view voice and these voice devices, I, I do have uh, I do I have Siri on my phone, I have Alexa, and then I have um, I have Google Home at home. You know, I feel that at, at the stage we are on, we're on, and this is the term that I had I, I had mentioned this to you. I feel like it's transactional, transactional, um, and it's not conversational yet. You know, those are the terms that that, that best describe it. Meaning that, um, you know, I ask a question, the voice assistant gives me a response back. Yeah. But, you know, uh, even though it's, it's, it's a myth, but it's like a goldfish, basically. It forgets that it ate, right? <laughs> but so it, it doesn't know, like I asked that question so that the next question is a brand new question. It's not a, or an inquiry, it's a brand new inquiry. It's not a conversation that, that flows nicely. I think now I started seeing, I think it was just a, a recent update, maybe a year old, uh, maybe, maybe nine months that Google Home started to uh, have and stay on a little bit further out after it responds to you to kind of hear what what's your next thing. Right. I think it's getting there. I don't I don't know. I, I think there's a lot that needs to be done to understand for these voice assistants and the AI behind them and machine yeah. learning to understand that this is a conversation and what the context is, just like you do textual search. Based so, on textual search, it knows what the intention is based on bounce rate and all those kinds of things. Right. Google puts up the best results and the best uh, uh, paid ads, for example. You know, that gives you a lot of relevance. A couple things that you touched on there that I think are super important as we think of in this space. One, I'll just start with the, the point about context. That's something that's way too often missed. And again, I'll go back to the parallels to web and mobile design, right? We were, when you're designing things in mock-ups in a paper uh, or on a PDF, you have one experience with them. Then when you go to working prototypes, you have an entirely different experience. User testing is different. You just get better outputs. The software to do rapid testing and iteration in these things is really just getting there today in voice. So I think that's something where we're seeing some progress. Um, but the context is going to change as well. We talked about smart speakers. And so if I'm designing a voice experience today, the majority of usage I would actually expect to be over a mobile phone um, if it's Google Assistant, let's say. If it's Amazon, it's probably over an Echo speaker. But which room in the house is this? Should I be designing for something that it's okay that everybody else around me here, or can it ever have them think about, I mean, I mentioned, or you mentioned the voice AOR with Chase, We're talking about private banking details here. Do you want that broadcast out on a speaker, even if it's in your home? Maybe, maybe not. So starting to do context definition as these speakers or the assistants get integrated into auto more, totally different context. You're on the go, your location matters a lot. You might be able to make some assumptions about privacy if you're the only one, the user's the only one in the car. But maybe you actually need a question up front just to say, do you want this in solo mode or do you want this in crowded car mode, whatever it is. Trying to set up an experience so that you can learn the context fast up front and then go with it. A second thing, um, I think it's actually a really foundational question right now, I'll say in voice, because there's not a set answer. Um, Mark Webster is a friend of mine who runs uh, Adobe XD, the design software of Adobe. Um, he makes the point that we've kind of rushed into things in voice with an assumption that a human to human conversation is the paradigm we're going for. You know, we're mm -hmm. using, our, as we call it conversational assistant. Well, as humans, we like to like box things in, to keep right. it familiar, whatever is familiar to us. We, we right. like to put it into that box to say, this is what it looks like. Maybe it's completely a different medium. We never experienced it before, you know? I think yeah. Mark makes a really good point that when we go to a mobile phone, we aren't just flipping through a newspaper again, right? We do things like that. We do things like that, that, and that. These are gestures. They're short, shorthands and interface. We need to develop that language in voice as well. Maybe it doesn't always need to be 
this long form conversation sentence by sentence going through, but I need to learn the fast commands. And as humans, it's how we deal with any system. Like I hate referring back to uh, the antiquated phone trees because those are just the worst version of voice design. But all of us know you get into that thing, you start hearing the menu listed and you're just yelling zero operator right off the bat. You're trying to skip to the end. We need to start building in the understanding of navigation in voice with some good solid norms so every voice designer is helping their user get to the end they need as fast as possible. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you, you just mentioned uh, voice designer, right? These titles and professional titles don't right. exist today. Like like being an e-commerce guy or, or e-commerce growth yep. hacker or whatever. A couple of years ago, it didn't exist. No, no such thing. That, that word didn't exist. And it's interesting that you're throwing out these uh, titles that I think uh, if, if we have audience members who are in HR, I think they should be, uh, they should be thinking yeah. of those kind of titles that, that they will be the next uh, kind of uh, set of profession. I mean, you saw the team that I built uh, at Vayner. The people who did our design were not voice designers before. They were UX designers. Voice, right? Yeah. Yeah, I they remember were, Jody. Yeah, shout out to you, Jody if she's watching. <laughs> or, or you know Claire Mitchell, right? Claire. Yeah, uh, Claire also, yeah. Job, uh, at Amazon working on some professional service consulting there. Claire was a product designer before coming in. And what we were building here were interactive products. So she had a lot of those product design principles that came in and made her a really great voice designer. But it's not, you're right, it's not a skill set that's existed. There's not, there are some training programs now, and some of them better than others. There's, there's some good online training programs, I'll say. But this is all new. The people building this best in the, best in the world uh, experiences right now don't know the answers. So I'd say there's going to be a lag from that getting figured out to matriculating down into training programs. Oh yeah. So my next question is, is actually at my heart, right? Okay. Uh, because being an e-commerce guy, growth hacker and all that, all those kinds of things, uh, lots of hype, voice commerce. This is going to be the year voice commerce, you know, uh, let's go. Right. Uh, I, I don't see it. I mean, I, I do see the numbers being reported, uh, by, by, uh, for, for example, by, uh, Amazon and stuff like that related mm -hmm. to commerce related to voice and stuff like that. I think it's getting there. Uh, and and um, uh, just for the audience, uh, just to give context, uh, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It actually is is growing, but it's not growing explosively the way we had predicted like two, three years ago. Those projections, I think, did every, well, I don't know if they did a disservice or not. They got everyone amped up. And it's funny that you say like voice commerce, this is going to be the year. I'm like, last year was going to be the year. 2018 was going to be the year. I mean, I've been to CES the last, I think, three or four years. And Every year is the year of voice, right? It's voice added to everything and commerce happening. But I remember those, um, I forget if it was Gartner, whose early projections had this as like a $4 billion space. I think it was 2 billion or 4 billion. I forget what it was. Um, that, that threshold should have been hit a couple of years ago by their projections. We're nowhere near that, right? It's not growing at that clip. Um, but I think to your point, A, it is growing and trending there. And I would look at, voice as um, maybe more akin to what Amazon was seeding with a dash button compared to what it's doing on the desktop or mobile e-commerce site, right? It's going to be hard to comparison shop over voice to check out different options. It's much more replenishment oriented. It might be about, again, having a positive first session and then moving into a subscribe and save. So we've talked with... Um, with customers who are building something that's a little bit more of a complex product, but maybe now instead of just having paper instructions when it arrives, you have you know, built in instructions. So I buy it over Amazon. I'm getting the, uh, the glowing light alert that my delivery is on its way. When the delivery arrives, I get a notification that says, Hey, do you want help with the setup? And it's walking me through setup. I have a positive session and now it's there for incremental sales. I think that's where we're going to see voice playing more of a role. So, Quick more more like education and customer service, the initial steps, I guess. Yeah. That side of it or the all the way other side of subscribe and save, just buy me more toilet paper. You know the one I want. I just want another one. It's a dash button. by I, Actually, the notification light does go on on my Alexa. It says that, hey, you, you bought this thing 30 days ago. Uh, it yeah. might be time for you to re-up. Would you like me to send another one? Yeah. You just have to tell me. And I, I, if I say yes, it, it will send it to me. So I but don't have to even... It's not even a click anymore. It's not like a one-click ordering. It's voice. I just say yes, you know. It's zero it's click. 
<laughs> the two places where voice is going to really excel, right? And this gets back to that ambient computing, the ability to move from interface to interface, when what you need to do, like your star rating example at the beginning, is give one quick piece of information, have it actioned. You just want to say yes or no, go for it. Voice is awesome. If you need interactive instructions, particularly that are hands-free, again, voice can be really good. But that's kind of two extremes on the scale. Everything else in the middle where I might want to check out three options and decide between them and I want to look at comparative reviews, all of that, not so great by voice today. Yeah. The, um, um, so uh, w one, of, uh, one of the big things that our audience uh, uh, joins in because of my kind of my background with growth and growth hacking mm -hmm. and stuff like that, is voice... Uh, a growth channel, or is it more of a exploratory channel that I, I I should think about for my for my brand and start playing in it so that I I know, or is it something that I can go in and I'm going to see a humongous turnout? Are there some things, some categories where it makes sense uh, as a growth channel versus like what you said earlier as a customer service, training, education, notification type thing? The spaces where so on balance, I would say as I was saying earlier. I'm not looking at voice as a main growth driver in general across most categories. A couple where maybe that's an outlier, or at least I'll say, even if it's experimental today, there could be a near-term opportunity. Um, I get really excited in spaces like quick service restaurants, um, fast fashion, like quick, somewhat transactional retail for voice click and collect order ahead. That's a space that's growing fast right now. There's some really good providers there. Um, you can look at companies called Jetson AI or Blue, BLU.AI, both of whom are good voice retail solutions that can upload a product catalog in you know, a matter of minutes and get you a workable voice solution. Then you can go into some shopping customization there. Those are spaces, again, I don't think, I wouldn't call it a growth channel even there because it's not doing the discovery and the acquisition work for you. But what it might do is streamline the shopping experience, help to do some card expansion, things like that. It could be really powerful. And then especially as you start moving the context into auto, again, really important there, dovetailing with this trend of contactless and all of our concerns during COVID of standing in a retail, like an enclosed retail space. You want to get as much of that comparison and shopping done before you get in, this, in the room. That side makes sense. The other where um, you might have some interesting acquisition opportunities is actually on the publishing and content side. Um, I'll give an example. We work closely with, uh, during the time at Vayner, with NPR. And um, mm -hmm. uh, viewers out there who know the show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, we created an interactive version of that called the Wait, Wait Quiz. Um, so it's same talent from the on-air show, new games every week, you can play along. We were seeing really, really compelling acquisition numbers there and great retention. So, and again, these are all on a scale for voice, but we were in in the tens of thousands, I'll say, of recurring weekly users. Good weeks might've been up near 50, 60, even 70,000. Uh, smaller weeks, lower tens of thousands. But it was starting to be a meaningful recurring audience for an interactive game that was gonna take people several minutes to play their way through. It was a lot of fun. And they were coming back each week, accumulating some streaks. And we had a lot of gamification that mechanisms coming into play there. But there it's a way for NPR to take an existing audience, mostly. They're, they're not getting a lot of net new people to the franchise. But if you're a fan of the broadcast show, here's a new property where you can extend engagement, spend a little more time, and then NPR can figure out ways to monetize this incremental audience. Um, again, I don't know that that's really going to hit the, your point about growth. I, I don't think this is where, as like growth hacking, I'm trying to grow from the ground up, that this is where you're spending your time. I think it is more in that other bucket of being ready as particularly that integration into auto. And you know, we talk about hearables and for simplicity's sake, just like Echo Buds, uh, the idea of walking around and basically having Amazon Alexa in an earbud in my ear or mm -hmm. the same with Pixel Buds or as those- Or Google buds. Glasses. <laughs> yeah, Google Glasses, but the people actually wear, how about that? Bose <laughs> frames, right? Bose frames are pretty interesting. I like that hardware. Yeah. Um, as people are walking around with an assistant built into what's in their ear or in their car, to me, the context just opens up tremendously and all these high value use cases get a lot more real. I'm frankly just not gonna sit in my house and talk to my Echo Dot about a whole shopping exchange when I can just pull my phone out or my laptop out. But if I'm walking around outside and it's not convenient to look down at a phone or if I'm driving a car and suddenly voice is a better interface, 
this, that context gets a lot more valuable. You know, it's funny. Uh, the, the reason I smiled was it, it, you reminded me of uh, like in the 80s and 90s, uh, if I saw a person coming down the street on the other side and they were talking to themselves, I would cross yeah. the road and, and like try to avoid them. What's normal today is people, whether oh. they have uh, AirPods in their ear and they're talking, it's yeah. pretty normal, right? Yeah. They probably may not even have it and they're talking. And I think that that's pretty normal because they might be having a conversation with someone and there's some kind of a voice, voice device. But yeah. growing up as a kid, I would avoid that part of the street because I thought that there might be something wrong with a person, you know, <laughs> and I didn't want to get attacked. Crazier AirPods, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, while you were saying earlier, um, I, I think you and I are trying to fit, uh, or the world is trying to fit right. uh, a voice into a funnel that is familiar to us, even even in, in, a, in a broader scale, right? Whether it's a marketer's funnel or if it's a sales funnel or it's... A, Maybe, maybe it's not a funnel. Maybe maybe it's a maybe it looks like bubbles. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't look like a like this that you could put it into a perfect infographic that so you say you awareness this 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 and then it leads to some kind of conversion. Conversion could be a sign up saying yes, giving a right. rating or something. I think we're trying to fit it into this. It this may not exist. It may be we need to rethink this whole interaction uh, well, with voice. Just think about the nature the the analogy of a funnel, right? What is that pointy bottom of the funnel? If that's purchase, then you're right. Then I don't think this fits there. But if on the bottom of that funnel, there's a couple little loops that start putting back in, and I wanna say that I'm gonna maximize the value of everyone I get down this funnel. So we've got mass awareness, I reach a whole bunch of people with some top of funnel message, cool. Get a few more down, maybe a little more engagement, maybe hitting with secondary or stronger sales push messages. Then I get to conversion. I think what we run into with an issue oftentimes is either ignoring what happens after conversion or switching our analogy entirely and suddenly it's a, we're out of that mindset. It's the same customer, it's the same shopper who converted there, who I wanna now turn one purchase into card expansion and frequency, right? I want lifetime value enhancement. Those are the places where I'll, even whether we call it voice or conversational assistant, which I think is probably a better term for us here, whether it's text or voice, something interactive, think about same ways you might use SMS in these cases, right? If you're gonna have an SMS cadence or a CRM cadence, couldn't some of that be done over voice? Like, I think yes. I think it's about thinking of a new interface that fits with those elements of a marketing system. So I'm not averse to using the funnel as an analogy. I just think it's incomplete. It gets you to a purchase and you gotta say, what happens after that purchase? Well, I've seen you design CRM systems and retention systems for customers that turn me as someone who might've one time tried one product out into someone who's coming back every month and buying an incremental, like the lifetime value of that retention is huge. And I become, not only am I buying more, but if done right, I'm also converted into not just a loyalist, but an evangelist. And I'm out there spreading the message to others. I think that part of the marketing system, whether we want to use funnel or not, is where these interactive technologies in general come into play. And voice has a lot of potential there. You know, it's funny you brought up chatbots, right? Uh, and and chat, chatbots being, SM, whether it's SMS or, or you're using Messenger or anything like that, a lot of brands there, the, the, the familiar box they tried to put it into was email communication. Yep. <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. not, it's a different medium. Totally. It's completely a different medium and, and you have to flow it differently. And, yeah. But it's interesting that you're connecting the chatbots to voice conversations and, and voice flow, right. or, you know, it's, it's sort of automation, I think. I think it's somewhere there. I, I don't think I don't think it looks like email. It doesn't look like a website. It doesn't look like an app, you know, because those are very familiar ways. And I think uh, uh, folks that uh, crack the code with that, brands or or, or even app developers, right. I, I think it's going to be uh, uh, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, so one one thing, Patrick, I'm going to remind you, right? Um, we're in the final like uh, uh, six seven minutes of the show. Uh, you and I have been mentors also and we actually yep. one of our mentorship that we did uh we actually uh guided students from cornell tech shout out to cornell tech uh they, they were our neighbors in new york city and um uh, you know we we took uh, uh students under our wing to do a project using voice and we were experimenting there uh i'll, I'll let you take it you can explain well we did a couple what, of what the context was yeah. yeah are you thinking about the accessibility job applications yep. one yeah yeah we had a couple of these so that was one where I think you wrote the challenge that was so strong to the team 
which was how to create a truly accessible experience using voice. Um, we, at the time, there's a lot of conversation bubbling around voice as this great accessibility driver. And I think you, like we were saying before, had the good experience or the good insight that, I don't know, it's accessible for some people. For a lot of people, it's not that accessible. Um, working with that team, though, it was really interesting. So they zeroed in on the use case of applying for a job. And specifically, as they got in there, it became, okay. Oh, just for the context there, Patrick, uh, yeah. unemployment among uh, folks with uh, disabilities is very high. You know, so applying for jobs is like the very first step right. into, uh, in, into getting a face time to do any kind of interview, let alone getting, getting a job. So the yeah. goal of this was to kind of assist with that. Go ahead. Patrick. And I think even in the way you state that, you brought in the challenge, you intentionally and we intentionally were very open-ended. We said, what's going to be an accessible experience? And naturally, the student group came to us with some questions about that that turned into the work that actually needed to be done here. Designing the thing is one thing, but figuring out first and foremost, who is it for? That was a huge question up front. And they went through a bunch of different groups that you might need to help with accessibility. They ultimately landed on designing for the blind specifically. And it was kind of based on an insight about just how poor screen reader technology is, especially when you're trying not just to read a long block of text, but to deal with all the different fields that you're filling in for a job application. Like it's a mess trying to use the screen readers for a job application. So let alone, I mean, ADA compliance levels of websites is very poor. I mean, absolutely. there are very few that had got into trouble. They right. became ADA compliant, Americans with Disabilities Act compliance, you know, and depending on the level. So even if you use those screen readers, the pages are not built uh, for it to be actually read out because it just looks like an image or it looks like a video, you know. And so I think the exercise that this group had to go through that we kind of coached them through, um, it's very high level. It's basically, I think, a useful exercise no matter what you're building, certainly in any digital product. And I'll double down on that for voice, but basically defining who, how, what, where, and why for anything you're going to build. So first and foremost with this, it started with a combination of what and who. What were you going to do and for whom was it going to work? Um, if you just said it's going to expand accessibility to anyone with a disability, that's too many different need states to design. But that's people that have disabilities in terms of range of motion, in which case you better be designing a voice experience that connects to some kind of a mechanical piece that's going to help, I don't know, reach things or make uh, or connect with devices and control them. That's a whole different side of uh side of design that this project could have gone down we landed on for the blind with our who and so then after doing some interviews both with blind individuals and actually with some of the blind advocacy groups that was where i think the student group got this insight about the challenges with job applications and that being a real need state in the community so okay they had a what what do we need to do help with does that help with uh job applications for whom for the blind and it was pretty open and i don't think we got more specific than that within the blind, but in general, we try and go through the exercise of building what we, I call an IDT, an inspirational design target. I want to get as much texture to that imagined individual that I'm designing for as possible so that I can bounce every design decision off that and see was it right or wrong. And then it needs to extrapolate out. It's got to work for others outside of just that tight target, but that's kind of your guide. Was it right or not? So that's our who and our what. Our why it's got to be a value proposition that makes sense. And so we already said there was a huge need state based on the really bad state of technology here, the really bad ADA compliance and screen readers. So our why was we needed an experience that when you used it after it was designed, worked better than what was out there in market right now. The where, we were able to do some context building around this and assume, to make a lot of assumptions about a job application. It was way different than if we had wanted to do, say it was, Say we, they take that same brief about accessibility, but it needed to be accessibility to buildings or something on the go. Well, then we'd have to design for a context, assuming it was being used on a mobile phone or with some kind of a hearing imp implant or something like that. Um, we could actually assume the at-home speaker or just a, a general smart speaker because you can basically choose to sit where you want while you do the application. So we got our who, our why, our what, our where, and then the how piece of this gets really important. That's what are the different data sources you need to be able to tap into to bring something to life? So in this case, that meant integrating with job application engines. So it meant talking, looking at, I'm trying to remember who it was, monster.com or Indeed. Indeed, it was Indeed, yeah. Yeah, so there it was, what are the API integrations that are public and available? 
If they aren't public, who are you going to have to negotiate with? But that's true of anyone out in the space who's building anything here. There's a certain amount that you can process native in Alexa. But if you don't want it to get back to that issue, we started this whole conversation with where I do something during my Alexa skill and then I come back and look on your website and it doesn't remember me from over there. You've got to be passing tokens behind this. You've got to be integrating across APIs with the rest of your digital system. So in that case, great. They had an existing job application database where they were able to get API access and pass to that. Um, so the team was able to build that thing down. Got to, I thought, a really impressive prototype in pretty short time there. Um, and it's a space that I've seen some other uh, really interesting uh, experimentation. There's a guy you can check out named, I want to pronounce his name right, I believe it's Gordon Collier, who is doing a lot of experimentation around um, voice job applications and building some stuff in that space. Interesting. Yeah. Right. So uh, we're actually almost to the end, and and I always give a huge value to the audience members that I, that that join us. Uh, so Patrick, what is that hundred thousand uh, dollar strategy or hack that you would recommend uh, to business owners, brand managers, um, uh, even agencies, whoever's uh, joining us on the, uh, uh, during this, and also in the recording, that yeah. they should go and do right now, like if, literally in the next hour. <laughs> so. I feel like I've gone on and on about the voice first click and collect today, the shop ahead by voice. I'm super bullish on that. I would be investing my time and energy if you work either in that space, or even if not, look at what are the couple of front end systems and the rest, let's use quick service restaurants. What are the predominant point of sale systems that are their front end? And can you construct a really good voice front end that plugs into those? You don't need to build the whole system from scratch. You need a voice interface for shopping there. So that's one space I think it's exciting. Let's do one other one here. What is the voice interactive packaging? So everyone who's thought about an unboxing experience and what that can look like. How do you reimagine unboxing when you have an interactive voice assistant? Go with an assumption that there's an interactive speaker there. When I rip open the box, the very first print on the inside should say, ask Alexa blank to, un to begin your unboxing here. And how am I coaching people through an awesome unboxing experience and migrating that out into return purchase. I mean, especially if you're selling like food items and stuff like that, I think it's just a no brainer to give the next 10 recipes uh, to, to guide them through it, to add the other uh, skill set. Through, yeah, beauty, if you like this, here's three other looks you can try, all the rest of that, absolutely. Very cool. Well, Patrick, uh, thank you for uh, joining us and, and sharing uh, your knowledge. And um, uh, we, have, we have had a lot of great interaction from the audience. I wanna thank the audience uh, that Thanks joined us me. live as well as uh, the audience members that are going to be watching this on recorded on all the popular platforms. It will be available within the next uh, uh, moment, few moments there. Uh, awesome. Thank you for joining us. How can people get in touch with you? I did I did put up your, uh, uh, your LinkedIn here, uh, yep. DM LinkedIn. you. Yeah, LinkedIn is gonna be the best option or frankly, just over email as well. I'm at givens, G-I-V-E-N-S-P, as in Patrick, at gmail.com, um, responding for both of those. All right, awesome. Well, thank you for joining us, Patrick, and uh, stay safe and uh, and uh, conquer the world with voice. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right, bye-bye.